<laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much for coming today. I'm uh, actually very excited to be here and talk about fashion photography. And we already have some really great uh, questions that you guys have submitted. So I'm going to be answering those kind of along the way. Um, feel free to just type in the chat. I have it live so I can see you guys, you know, I can see your questions come up as I talk. And that's always really helpful because, uh, you know, sometimes it can get kind of awkward just talking to a screen. <laughs> so if you guys have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, if you want to win the hard drive um, at the end of this, um, be sure and put your name. Um, I think it's on the main website uh, where, it's, where it's live. You can put in uh, to win the hard drive. Um, and if you guys need a link to that, let me know. And then I will also be giving away uh, something at the end. If you want to follow me on Instagram, it's under I am Dixie Dixon. And I'll be randomly reaching out to one of you guys to send you a gift. So, all right, let's get into it. Um, huge thanks to Radorama for having me. Very, very grateful to be here. I buy things from Adorama all the time. So they're a great, great canvas store to work with. And huge thanks to Sandisk as well for having me on today. Obviously, I've been using DTech and Sandisk products pretty much my whole career. So it's always good to get to work with them on these different uh, speaking engagements and projects and whatnot. And again, if you want a gift later, I will randomly reach out to someone on Instagram. It's under I am Dixie Dixon. So feel free to follow me and you can unfollow me later if you don't like me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, you can win a gift later on in this talk. So um, I'm basically an open book today. So feel free to, you know, ask questions. And basically, I am a fashion advertising and commercial photographer based out of Fort Worth, Texas, which is near Dallas. So I have been doing this, gosh, over 10 years. I've kind of lost count at this point. And ultimately what I've discovered is photography really is the outward expression of inner significance. And as photographers and creators and filmmakers, we have such power today to create images and to create these different content for different brands. And if you really think about it, we make the influencers influential. We help brands um, become iconic. We help businesses move product. Um, so we're really, really important these days. And if you think about it, our clients are all around us. Everyone is a brand these days. So if you can create a niche for yourself in photography, you can really be successful today because everyone is a brand and everyone needs content, whether it's a business, a marketing firm, a personal photo shoot, whatever it is. So it really empowers us photographers today to get out there and shoot and create a living doing what we love. Um, I never knew if I would be able to make a living doing this, but you know, it's crazy because I applied for an investment firm job right out of college and I got that job, but I ended up turning it down at the advice of one of my mentors. He said, Dixie, if you're interested in photography, now is the time to go for it before you get locked in a lifestyle. And so I went for it and I honestly haven't looked back. I've been able to make a good living doing photography and it's just my ultimate passion. I can't imagine doing anything else. Um, I was not made for the nine to five. <laughs> I'm just not, I'm very, very much an introvert and uh, very much kind of rock along to the beat of my own drummer, but um, it's definitely been an adventure adventurous career and it's definitely been a, a really fun one. So I'll get into more of that. And uh, this is a recent shoot for um, just some personal work that I was wanting to photograph this beautiful giraffe named Gerald and a beautiful model Carson. I love photographing animals and capturing that combination between, you know, the, the beasts of our planet and, you know, the beautiful models and um, capturing that beautiful connection. And it's just so much fun because you just never know what the animals are capable of. You can't really walk into these kinds of shoots with a lot of fear because animals can obviously smell fear. And you don't want to wear perfume. You don't want to use strobes. So you have to be really careful when working with animals, especially in animals this large. I mean, Carson is probably six feet tall. Uh, so she she's quite tall. I would look like really tiny, I think, next to that giraffe. Um, but it's just such a fun experience. The owner of this uh, giraffe, he adopts orphan animals and takes care of them and rehabilitates them. Uh, so it's just a really fun shoot. He was definitely a ham um, <laughs> throughout that process. This is in the Provence in, in France. 
I love the idea of using complementary colors, which are colors that are across from each other on a color wheel. So for instance, using yellow and purple, uh, blue and orange, using these different color combinations is really, really helpful to really make your images pop. So if you think about going into a shoot, think about, you know, if you have a green background, you know, having your client wear red, or if you have a blue background, having your client wear orange, and it's going to really pop off the page. It's really going to just scream, you know, beauty and, and really look beautiful and vibrant and full of life. So I do that quite often. Um, this is also in Provence. I travel whenever possible. Uh, you know, it's just, you get to really know yourself when you travel. And I think it's a really good a uh, way to build your portfolio and build other locations and whatnot. So anytime I go on a trip, even if it's a, a trip for vacation or whatnot, I'll usually try to book an extra day or two to set up a test shoot. And if you're not familiar with a test shoot, a test shoot is basically a portfolio shoot where you set up, you know, the hair, makeup, wardrobe and model, and you go out and shoot some content for your fashion portfolio. So it's really like a portfolio shoot. So I try to do that, you know, on every different trip that I go on. Um, this was in Brazil and Florianopolis uh, a couple of years ago, probably a few years ago now. And uh, I just love pops of yellow. Yellow is my favorite color. And uh, so I try to add it into these and, um, we used a little bit of Papa strobe here. It's just the end of day lighting, really simple. You know, if the lighting is beautiful in a location, I'm not going to overly complicate it with strobes. Um, this one just needed a little kiss of light on their face. It was kind of getting a little bit dim. So we just bounced that light in there and just one light with the beauty dish, really simple, simple stuff. Um, any of you guys can shoot that. This is natural light. This was shot with the Nikon Z. This is for the Z7 campaign, and it's is a 35 millimeter lens. I kind of love the 35 millimeter for shooting kind of wide angle fashion stuff, especially when you want to capture that cool background in the frame. Um, you know, I'm definitely a sucker for the longer lenses, but sometimes like the 35, 14 to 24 are really useful for even fashion photography or architecture. So you can kind of get that go and this was um all natural light uh, again for that z7 campaign you know the light is coming from the side you can see it's just simple window lighting all you guys can create this that's what i love about natural lighting uh, you just uh, can create you can see what you see is what you get it's really simple stuff so i definitely started out primarily a natural light shooter i didn't have any training in strobes uh, the way that I learned strobes was I would rent a studio by my house and I would go in there and I would try to master one light at a time. And so I would try one light with a beauty dish, with an umbrella, with a strip box um, and see what that did, see what height that I liked it, um, see, you know, the spread on the lighting, depending on what it was. And I would do that at, like once a week, I would do that. And that's kind of how I learned the basics of lighting and working with strobes. Um, and it really kind of helped me learn as I go. And I'm still learning. I mean, we're all still learning. I feel like I'm just getting started in some ways. But um, yeah, this is all natural light. I love the, the vintage kind of style of this. Uh, this is a dress that I actually picked up in Paris um, at a little vintage store. So I'm always looking for different props and things along the way when I travel. Um, I love shooting swimwear. I kind of got my start shooting swimwear. I was actually... Um, hired on to shoot for a TV show called Get Out, and it was on HDNet television. And I was just barely out of college, and I showed my portfolio to this producer who was producing this TV show. And they were needing a still photographer to photograph the swimsuit models for the show. So obviously, I was like, yes, that sounds like a blast. Um, so we went to Ibiza, Spain, Miami, Puerto Rico, kind of all over the world, you know, photographing for the show for about four years. And so I got to really learn how to connect with the people that I'm photographing and, uh, you know, just working with models and talent and figuring out how to direct them and how to relate with them. And what the producer noticed and the director, you know, I was working with this cinematographer who was amazing, um, but he did not make the models feel very comfortable. And so he ended up having me direct a lot of the models for the show, for the swimsuit um, shoots basically. So I ended up doing a lot of the directing and that's kind of where I got started in directing video and I really like fell in love with it. Um, so I've been shooting video ever since and doing a lot of directing, um, and whatnot. This was for a retreat magazine. 
This is Taylor Bryant. She's an amazing, amazing model to work with. Um, this is all natural light. Keep in mind, all of these are all natural light. We're just using a big uh, silver reflector board just to bounce some light back in her face. Um, just very simple stuff, very easy. We have a really great retoucher, uh, Solstice Retouching. He does such a great job on this stuff. Um, you know, just creating. And this was actually a vacation that I booked an extra couple days and we set up the shoot. Like I said, just kind of creating some new content for the portfolio. And then I submitted it to Retreat Magazine and then they picked it up and published it. So that's a really great way to get your name out there if you guys are interested in fashion photography um, to create content and then submit it to magazines because you never know what they might uh, pick up and release. And then your name gets out there even more to these different fashion brands. So this was a tricky shot. I was literally on my tiptoes, like leaning over on these rocks. You can tell this is a really comfortable pose uh, for this model to do, but um, it ended up being a really nice S curve, really beautiful shot. So sometimes the high angles looking down can be really interesting with fashion photography. So think about changing your angle, like getting a lower angle or a higher angle, just changing your perspective might give you a whole different look at what you're shooting. So I try to do that a lot as I shoot. Um, I also shoot a lot of commercial work. This is an advertising shoot for Nikon. And uh, you get all these photographers out shooting in Sand Harbor in uh, Lake Tahoe. Gosh, I love that location. I've shot quite a lot there for multiple campaigns and uh, for Twin Peaks and a little calendar that I shot. Um, gosh, you just can't take a bad picture there. I mean, everything there is absolutely gorgeous. So pretty. Um, this was actually my very first big production. This was for a company called Magpul, and they make all of the, basically the um, accessories for these guns for the military. So they wanted a high fashion calendar uh, that basically the proceeds would go to the Marine Reconnaissance Foundation. And that's a really nice organization that uh, gives to wounded warriors families and helps them out. So it was a really cool cause. And we got to create like this crazy, a uh, high fashion calendar um, and only in Texas could you probably get away with walking down the middle of downtown Dallas, you know, with a big rifle. <laughs> it's kind of a crazy adventure, but we did, you know, 13 different shots. That one was the cover. This is one of the shots that we did. Every shot was completely different and uh, just a really fun production. They give us free, uh, full creative control. When a client gives you that, that's always such a such a joy because then you can concept these things in your head. Um, yeah, I'm actually, I should look at the questions you guys are sending in. Let's see. Question from Brian. Do you have quick tips on working with models? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, definitely always with working with models, have their favorite mu music playing when they walk in the door. That instantly sets them at ease. Um, always have food on set. You don't want the models going hungry or the crew for that matter. Everyone gets hangry when they're hungry. Um, also, it's good to come up with a mood board beforehand. So literally pinpointing the different kinds of poses and the mood that you want the model to exude and to show them that before you go into the shoot. And then they have an idea of what exactly you're looking for. Cause you can communicate it with words, but until they see it on paper, it's a really good idea to communicate with pictures uh, because it's really, you know, we're a visual industry and I think it's a really great way to get them started so that you're not overly posing them. You know, I don't do a lot of posing when I shoot. I just show them my vision and then we kind of create it sort of like a dance. And I tend to shoot through moments as opposed to stopping and posing and only taking like two shots. I shoot quite a lot of shots, but when the model hears the click of that camera, they know when to change poses. Uh, so it kind of ends up being a bit of a dance and I might burn some digital files in order to get exactly what I'm looking for, uh, but it's a really effective way to shoot models because when they hear that click and they you're clicking pretty often, they know that they're doing a good job and they're getting in their mode and they feel confident. Obviously showering them with comp uh, compliments is really huge. Don't be one of those photographers that just sits there behind the shutter and just clicks the button and doesn't say a word. That is the most awkward feeling on the other side of the camera um, that you can get. So definitely give feedback. Girl, humans, we like feedback. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the main tips on working, uh, working with models. That's a very good question. Um, all right, so I'm now primarily shooting with the Nikon Z9. Ah, 
love that camera. I'm obsessed with that camera. Um, it is crazy sharp. Um, I primarily use uh, prime lenses. And keep in mind, I need to update my gear bag. This, this photo needs to be updated because obviously it has the older Nikon lenses. I'm now using mostly Z lenses, um, but there's still all the primes. I've got the 105, the 85, the 35. Um, I do, I did adopt a zoom, the 14 to 24 for architecture, which I really love. Um, but it's all prime lenses mostly because I just find that their sharpness is just crazy good. Um, and then also someone had a question over here on the color checker. Um, yes, I do use a color checker for all of our different shoots, especially for advertising photography when the color is so important um, to get those colors perfect. So we'll use literally a color checker um, before every every single um, setup. So not every single shot, but we'll we'll have the my assistant hold up the color checker in front of the model. Um, before every, you know, setup that we do so that I can basically go and pinpoint the color after the fact exactly to my liking because the color changes depending on the light wherever you are. Um, so it can really change quickly. So with every setup, it's a good idea to hold up that color checker in front of the model so that you have that in the bag and, uh, you know, you can get that going. So that's a very good question. Let's see here. So here's kind of a list of my clients. You know, I kind of shoot for a broad range of different clients. You know, I'm, I'm in Texas, so you can't really just shoot um, fashion. Well, I guess you can, but I, I shoot it all, um, especially after the Rona and all that stuff. You know, it's, it's, we kind of have to, as photographers, be very, uh, um, nimble and problem solving. And I've had to, you know, take on jobs that I wouldn't have thought that I'd be doing. For instance, now I'm shooting for hotels. Um, and like, I just did a big shoot for, uh, this past year for Hotel Drover, which is a autograph collection Marriott hotel. So I ended up working with, uh, Marriott and their crew and never would I've ever thought that I'd be shooting architecture because I'm such a people photographer. Uh, but I really enjoyed it. So it's good to, to differentiate. And I always say, like, if you're given an opportunity that you are not necessarily, you don't think you're prepared for, prepared for, always say yes, and then figure it out later. Uh, that's what has sort of been my mantra throughout my career, because a lot of times I'll be given jobs that I don't necessarily feel fully prepared for. But if you're given the opportunity like God wouldn't give you that opportunity without knowing that you can do it. So it's a good idea to just take it on, figure it out along the way. If you mess up, you're going to, you're going to learn a lot and figure it out. Um, but I would definitely recommend going for it and just uh, figuring it out along the way. Cause I never would have thought I was shooting food photography or architecture. Um, so when I got those jobs, I obviously did a lot of research into what kind of lenses I needed and whatnot. And I kind of figured it out. So definitely recommend that. Um, teamwork really does make the dream work. I've spent so many years building my team and oh my gosh, it's just been such a huge process, but I've found an amazing team that I work with on every production. Now I have my lighting tech, Eric is just, he's incredible. He has, you know, so much more lighting experience that I do. And Nancy's my producer, Nicole is an assistant that works with us. And then I have a, you know, broad range of makeup artists and stylists that I work with, but it took a while to build those crew. Um, I built them on a website you guys uh, may be familiar with it, uh, Model Mayhem. So that was like the networking site for fashion photography back in the day. Now we just use Instagram. It's just way easier. Uh, but, you know, you can see how with these different productions, how the team can grow. Um, but what's really cool is, is everyone is working towards the same goal. So if you can find people that really inspire you creatively, that love what they do, they're just going to take your work to that next level uh, very quickly without you even having to do anything. So I definitely recommend building your team as you go. But keep in mind, I only started out with just me and my model shooting and that was it. Uh, so I've just kind of like I figured out I wasn't very good at makeup. So I started sending the model to a Mac makeup counter to get her makeup done before the shoot. Even if it was just a portrait client, I would always send them to the, the Mac makeup counter because they train their makeup artists really well. Um, and it saves me a lot of time and retouching. So that was a really inexpensive way. Uh, that's my assistant, Nico. Um, but that was really an expensive way to basically get makeup done for each of my shoots. So before I had, you know, this team 
And then I started hiring on makeup artists and collaborating and then wardrobe stylists. Um, and it's just sort of grown very organically. And, uh, you know, every production is different. Some require all that. Some require just me with my camera. It just really depends on what it is that we're shooting. So, yeah, let's go to the questions. Um, yeah, review fast lighting techniques and remote locations. Yeah, so basically fast lighting techniques. My favorite is natural light with a reflector. And I don't use um, the normal circular reflectors usually. We will literally go to the hardware store like Home Depot or Lowe's and pick up um, basically insulation board and we cut it in half. And we use that as a reflector on pretty much every shoot and a big bounce board. Um, it's a little bit softer. It doesn't um, fly away in the wind. Um, those little flimsy circle reflectors kind of just are too flimsy. I like the, the steady insulation board that we use. and They work really well. Um, it's a very inexpensive uh, way to shoot. And then I also will usually bring my B1 kit. So I've got the Profoto B1s. Um, I've got, um, you know, I haven't even had to upgrade those, but I, I had got those you know, a few years ago when I started shooting on location. So like this, for this particular photograph, I put the B1 um, behind the tree to kind of create a nice hair light and a stream of light in that, a little bit of lens flare um, just to light this frame. But usually we're just using like one or two lights on location at the most. And usually we'll have either bare bulb, um, especially if it's um, just like lighting back at the camera. For, so for this and for the hair light, we'll literally put it away from camera and kind of shine it towards my lens creates a little bit of lens flare, kind of gives it a mood. Um, so I would say those are my two favorite techniques for lighting on location. Um, shade is really beautiful. If you put the model in shade, especially midday, and just bounce some light back in there with the reflector board, that's a really easy way to shoot. Um, there's just so many ways to, you know, do quick setups, you know, with, uh, with remote locations. So I would definitely recommend bringing at least one light, the B1, a beauty dish, and then the reflector board. I think those are probably the the best kind of lighting for remote locations so you don't have to carry a bunch of stuff. And uh, this was actually for the Z7 campaign as well. I love capturing like streams of light through the window. So we actually used a fog machine here and it really helped us create those streams of light in camera as opposed to having to create those in post-production. I tend to love to do things in camera more than creating in post because um, I wanna be out in the field as much as possible and not stuck behind a computer as much as possible because <laughs> I like to be out in the field shooting, but this kind of has that Harry Potter type of vibe about it and uh, just a really fun, fun shoot that we did. So let's talk a little bit about workflow because I think that's a big understated part of, of photography. It's like kind of taken me years to sort of nail down this workflow. Um, but basically when I'm on set, I'm either shooting to a card, the SanDisk uh, memory cards, or because they're just, they're really good. They're really fast. Um, or I'm shooting tethered to a computer. And so when I shoot tethered, I'm shooting to Capture One software. And I found that that's just the best um, software for tethering, um, especially, I mean, if you look at the photographers like Annie Leibovitz and, you know, the huge photographers that are just out there killing it, they're using Capture One. There's just something about Capture One, the secret sauce that they use and the exports. I mean, you can just do so much with the color, um, the sharpness. Uh, there's just something they create in exporting far superior files, I think, than, say, Lightroom or Bridge. So I use Capture One primarily for tethering and for exporting. Um, we use the SanDisk uh, card readers. Right now I'm using the, the XQD cards, obviously, for the new Z9s. Um, really important. Um, I also use this tether deck uh, that Manfrotto started making. It's really cool. It's You put it on a tripod and you can just get it down so it doesn't fall, you know, because if somebody hits your... your uh, computer it's not going to fly off and whatnot so i've been using this pretty often um, it's like called the tether deck i believe so we're using that um, we'll usually have a digital tech on set and he's constantly backing up to three different hard drives so for that i'm using the g drive mobile ssds so i'll use this kind and then i also like these little sandisk ones um, the sandisk professional ones i've actually been using these more recently 
Um, I like that you can put your key ring around them, really durable, that you can throw them in your bag, really easy to use. And they are crazy fast because they're SSDs. Um, they're solid state drives. Um, you don't have to plug them into anything. So if you're on a remote location, they're extremely helpful for that. And I recommend having three of those on set as you can just, you know, back them up immediately as you're shooting. Because man, it is not a good feeling when you uh, when you lose files, um, especially when a client is putting a lot of money into a shoot. You definitely don't want to give them bad news that you've you know lost files or anything like that. So when we're in studio, you can actually get away with some of the plug-in drives, like this new G drive that Sandus just just launched. Um, we actually shot the campaign for that. Um, it's really an amazing, amazing. Um, G drive that they've done. It's got this cool aluminum exterior and you can customize the, the lighting on the screen with, um, with a little button so you can kind of display that or not display it. It's a really easy, easy drive to use. Um, so we're using that quite often in studio on set. It's blazing fast. Um, it's just a really great drive that I've been using. I've been enjoying using in addition to those little SSDs. So that's kind of on set. And then when I get back to the studio, um, basically when I wanted to back up everything, I use a program called Post Haste. And if you guys are not familiar with this program, it will change your life. <laughs> um, it's free. I think it's free. And it's basically a file management software to set up your folder structure. So if you go and download this, it's just, uh, Lucas Gilman actually turned me on to this software. So if you think about it, for every single shoot that you do, you have all these different folders that you have to set up manually and it just takes so much time. Um, so with this software, you create your one folder structure that you have for every single shoot, you're gonna have a similar folder structure other than the first name. Um, and then basically it creates all of that for you immediately. So it's like the click of a button. It creates your whole folder structure and then you can draw, drag and drop all of your shoots and different raw images into each folder. So I utilize this on every single production. I immediately come back, take those SSD drives and back them up onto the um, bigger hard drives and using post haste has just saved me so much time. Um, it's really easy to use. Uh, they have sample templates in there, like a photography template. Um, but you can see my folder structure here. You can copy it if you want. Um, you know, I've got model releases, property releases, call sheets, final print size files, TIFFs, RAWs, you know, basically everything you can imagine in there. Uh, so it's really, uh, really helpful. And so when I get back to the studio, then you see these big shuttles that I'm backing everything up to. And those are pretty huge capacity. They're 24 terabytes. And I just bought two more of these. So I've got, you know, two duplicate backups in my studio. And then I have also one offsite that I update pretty often as well, just in case something were to happen in my studio. But they're definitely the best drives to use. Um, I've been, you know, using G drive pretty much my whole career, you know, cause I've, when I first started, I was using some drives that had failed and I lost all of my first work. And that was heartbreaking, really heartbreaking. Um, when I was getting started, cause it was all of my like, very, very first work. And so then I switched over to using GTAC and Sandisk professional drives and I've never had a, an issue since. So, um, definitely recommend those. They use only enterprise quality drives. Really, really awesome. You can rely on them. Um, always have duplicate backups just in case, but they are extremely reliable. You can daisy chain them. They look cool in the studio. Um, they're just really, really amazing tools. So let me go into the questions really quick and just see. Um, let's see. Journey to being successful doing this alone. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, you can definitely be successful in this journey. You just have to have a laser focus on your goals of where you want to go. Like I, I do a vision board every year on the different goals that I'm looking to accomplish. Um, for instance, one of my vision boards a few years ago was that I wanted to work with Nikon and I'd put on my vision board a picture of like Ashton Kutcher with the, the Nikon or whatever, just to show that I wanted to work with Nikon. And then fast forward to two years after that, I ended up working with Nikon on, you know, a Nikon article and they hired me to shoot my first campaign for them. So it's, it's amazing how, you know, when you think about your goals and uh, 
you know, you, you kind of put it out there. You just never know what, what can happen. Um, but obviously it's taking crazy amount of hard work that, you know, no one sees in, in late nights and whatnot. Um, but hopefully some of the stuff that I bring up, you know, throughout this will, will kind of answer some of those questions. Um, when do you have a portfolio? Who do we send it to? How can one get hired for professional work with magazines? Yeah, so I did have a portfolio. Actually, I have it here to show you guys. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever worked with Graphy Studio, but I ordered one of these early on in my career. And it was like a collection of 20 of my best uh, photographs that I thought at the time. And it's like on nice photo paper. Uh, so I got one of these printed and I started showing this book to as many people as possible. I mean, you can't imagine how many people I showed this to. Um, just anyone who would look at it, creative directors, marketing directors, any brands, any boutiques, anyone I could get a hold of to show my work to and give them a card. I was, I was doing that. I was also doing cold calling. So when you're doing cold calling, um, you want to look for the brands and magazines that kind of showcase your style of photography and that you would be a good fit for. So then you'll want to reach out to the creative director and the marketing director um, or the art director at those different brands or ad agencies and just say, hey, I would love to stop by, show you my portfolio for 15 minutes, just to check out my new work. Um, you know, would love to meet you, give them a couple of times that work for you and just stop by there for 15 minutes and show them your new work and then basically keep them updated like once a month on your new work. And that's really how you stay in front of these people. So they think to hire you when a campaign is going to be launched. Um, so that's really the best way. And that's actually what I did uh, with, with Nikon. Uh, so it's a really good, good way to do that. Um, obviously, you have to have a really good website. You want to have all your work, you know, displayed on your website. Definitely be picky when choosing your images. It's also good to have someone else look through your images um, to kind of pick out the best ones because, you know, as photographers, we're so emotionally attached to our images. It's good to have a second pair of eyes on, though, on those. Um, yeah, I think that kind of answers that question. Oh, how does one get hired for work with magazines? So I, I actually suggest um, creating your own work. So going out and shooting um, some, like if you're into fashion, uh, to shoot a fashion editorial yourself, produce it, and then reach out to magazines and submit it to them. Because then once they see your work, they'll be more likely to hire you for future shoots. Uh, but they'll see that you can create a really cool fashion editorial. Usually it needs to be six to eight photographs with different looks in each one, a beauty shot, a wide shot, uh, a full length um, shot for like a cover. Um, so you want to definitely make sure you cover all your bases. Um, but yeah, that's a really good way to get into working with magazines. Um, let's see shooting with models. Am I concerned about AI generated photos? Yeah, I don't know what to think about that. <laughs> I think as photographers, we have to look at, you know, technology is just moving so fast and we either, either learn to adopt it and work with it and apply it to what we're doing, or we kind of, you know, it's just, we, we've got to learn to work with the technology. I think AI is, is interesting for creating mood boards and whatnot for me right now. Um, but I think that there's always going to be a need for actual photography because if you think about it, a wedding photographer isn't going to want their their wedding album to be AI generated. I mean, I can't imagine that. Um, so there's always going to be a need for photography. Um, so I don't think that I'm necessarily concerned about losing my job or anything. I think that certain parts of my job will be more automated because of AI. So that's a very good question, though, because that's all the rage right now with, with mid journey and whatnot. Um, so we'll get into the 85 millimeter campaign and then we'll, uh, I'll answer some more of y'all's questions. Y'all have really good questions. Thank you guys for sending those. Um, so this was a recent campaign for the new 85.12 lens. I don't know if y'all have heard of it, but this is the very first lens that Nikon has ever done. That's the 85.12. So really legendary launch in Nikon's history. They've never done an 85.12 before. So I was very, very excited when I got that phone call to shoot with it because I could not be more excited about this lens. So they wanted basically two different scenarios. They wanted a fashion scenario and then a wedding scenario. 
I don't shoot a ton of weddings or anything, but um, they wanted kind of the wedding style. So for the fashion shots, I ended up finding this amazing location on Peer Space. Um, if you guys have ever heard of Airbnb, peerspace.com is basically like Airbnb for location rentals for photography. Amazing tool. Um, you can do it hourly. You can do it daily. Uh, this amazing location came up on Peer Space in Fort Worth with these great sets, so all these different sets within this one location. Uh, so we ended up shooting there all day, creating all these different kinds of looks. They had this one location in there that had all these cool Edison bulbs and we had Ivy out there. He's such a cool rock star. He has this amazing hair. Um, and actually he wasn't even a fashion model on the modeling agency's page. He was just, I guess he was listed under actor, but I was like, he looks like a fashion model. You have to shoot him for this. So he's just awesome. We we ended up showcasing the bokeh of that lens really nicely in these. And then we added in Birdie, who's a really beautiful fashion model, um, really great to work with. And we just had literally one light, just a constant light to kind of light up their faces a little bit amongst those Edison bulbs. Um, very simple stuff. I believe we used an aperture light. If you guys are familiar with aperture and, um, you know, I like to get those detail shots. Obviously, this lens is all about the bokeh uh, or bokeh, however you like to <laughs> I like to pronounce that one. Uh, so I wanted to showcase that. It's a pretty hefty lens. I mean, it's pretty big. Um, but I mean, with Z9, it's a little bit heavier, but it's so worth it. So worth it. I'm uh, pretty obsessed with this lens. And then I ended up getting these cool backgrounds on Amazon uh, that really had some nice bokeh. They're like gold and silver. So we ended up, you know, shining a strobe back there to light the the background up a little bit and then getting some movement in her hair, making it very simple but effective kind of bokeh type shots. And uh, we did silver as well. So I want to do gold on gold, silver on silver, uh, just to make a really cool, beautiful shot. Very simple, simple way of lighting. And then we moved into the blue room and we ended up using a fog machine in there and uh, just cap capturing some cool kind of blue type of lighting. It looks very futuristic type of vibes. Um, and so we used all constant light on this particular shot. Very simple stuff, kind of lights her skin really nicely. And it's crazy how little retouching you have to do with this lens, just because the eyes will be tacked sharp and then everything else just falls out of focus so beautifully. So if you guys have ever tried using a fog machine, I mean, I definitely, I definitely recommend it. Um, because they can just add such a mood to your photograph immediately. It just It's like an instant mood creator, um, can kind of create some drama and some mystery, and it just really kind of makes a cool look to it. So I did lots of close-ups. When I'm shooting fashion, I like to start out wide and then move in close. So you'll get the wide shot, you'll get the three-quarter length shot, and you'll get a really tight shot, um, both vertical and horizontal, so you can have negative space if needed, especially when you're shooting for clients. You know, they can um, have some room for copy and for text and whatnot, especially in like a double page spread. Uh, so that's really helpful. Um, and then we went on location in the Fort Worth Stockyards and shot, you know, was, this was actually in December. So there was lots of Christmas lights out. So that kind of ended up being perfect uh, for this because we needed all that beautiful bokeh. So we just kind of, this was very run and gun. I was trying to keep the camera as uh, top secret as I could because the last thing you want to do is shoot a campaign and it gets released before, you know, it's actually released. Um, that could be a career killer. Uh, so you have to be very, very careful about where you shoot. So I always had my crew kind of around me um, when we were shooting this production just to make sure no one saw the lens. And this is just basically with an ice light. Um, highlighting his face on one side and then capturing the, the bokeh in the background really beautifully. And then this one was shot exactly the same way. So just very like run and gun type of shooting, but this lens really excelled uh, in that. I'm so excited about this lens. It's like, it's definitely my new favorite. Um, very simple stuff. I think, you know, I found that dress on some I think it was sheen or something like that um, so you can create really amazing photos and just use the very very simple type of gear and, and lighting and and whatnot you don't need you know obviously it is nice to have the 85 but um, you can create with the most simple gear ever so the next day we ended up at a, a cool wedding venue called the lazy hacienda it was like a spanish style wedding venue Really beautiful. I love shooting through windows. You create that nice bokeh. 
Um, man, what's so cool about this lens with the Z9 is the eye autofocus. Even if you're shooting 1.2, the eye autofocus is constantly moving to the model's eyes. So it's almost like you don't even have to work very hard to get those shots. Because when I used to shoot 1.2 lenses, I would be super scared to shoot 1.2 because if you are off by just a, a hair, it completely goes out of focus. But with the new auto eye, auto, eye autofocus, it's just, it's insane. The combination that between that lens and the Z9, it just, it works exceptional. Um, so I'm constantly using that um, when shooting one, two, and it just creates a really beautiful effect. Blurs your background really nicely. Um, this is one of my favorite ways to shoot. This is called what we call, Eric and I call garage light. It's basically you put the model right inside of a building or a garage and then you shoot in towards her and the light just wraps around your subject so pretty. Um, it's really glowy, really beautiful, especially for women. Um, and then I also added a little leaf in front of my lens to create a little bit of uh, lens flare on the left-hand side. Uh, but again, this is all natural light. We may have, I think we may have used a little bounce board to bounce a little bit more light into her face, but very simple. Any of you guys can shoot this stuff, very easy um, and effective type of lighting. So we, we stayed in that doorway for quite some time because it just looked so cool and really pretty. And then we also get the, the wind going in her hair. Um, we actually use a battery operated leaf blower to get the, the hair blowing. <laughs> Um, that's the easiest way that I found. Um, you can get those. I usually like the Makita. Um, I don't know that Ad Adorama sells those, unfortunately. <laughs> they should. That would be awesome. But it's I like the Makita brand leaf blower. Um, and they just blow the hair just enough, not too much. You don't want to get a plug-in leaf blower. Those will make them look like they're in a convertible like going down the highway. <laughs> so you want to keep it very soft and subtle. You don't want too much. Um, this one is actually completely unretouched. I didn't do any retouching or anything. This is straight out of the camera. So you can see how beautiful this lens just, just brings portraits to life and just how sharp it is with that eye autofocus. You can see every single eyelash. It just, it's mind blowing. Um, so it's really nice not having to do a lot of retouching. Um, love the little details that you can capture and the rings. You can do all this stuff easy with that lens and capturing the couple together. They are not a real couple. They were a couple for the day. <laughs> That's always an adventure. Um, and then I wanted to get kind of a cool framed out shot with these cactuses. I was literally sitting in the midst of these cactuses. I think I got a little prickled <laughs> while I was doing this, um, but it was so worth it for the shot. So worth it. Um, to kind of frame out your subjects. It's a really cool way to shoot. You guys are into framing and whatnot. And then getting those really close up headshots are really beautiful. The skin just glows. Um, and what's so funny is this particular shot is actually the parking lot behind her. Uh, but with that lens, it just goes creamy, beautiful. So you wouldn't think it would just be a parking lot back there. Um, that's really what the beauty of this lens is, is you can kind of focus on the subject and then everything else just goes super creamy and beautiful because um, the light was so backlit and perfect facing the parking lot of course you know uh, could have been facing the building but that was more direct light it was a little more harsh so I tend to go for that beautiful backlighting um, especially with women kind of get a nice hair light about some light back into the face and just looks really pretty and soft so you can see the difference in lens choices here um, between like using a 35 for a headshot versus an 85 versus a 180. Um, so I never use 35s for a headshot just because it distorts the model's faces. If you look at, you know, the people with iPhones taking selfies, um, they always have it at a high angle because it's such a wide angle, unflattering lens. I think it's equivalent to a 28 millimeter that the iPhone is. It's just not super flattering when it comes to portraits. So I tend to use at least an 85 millimeter. I'd say that that's probably my current favorite portrait lens. I also use the 105 quite a lot for headshots, um, but I would say the 85 is the minimum that you should use for when you're shooting headshots. Um, you can also go even longer like the 180 or the 200, which looks really cool too. You wanna really blur out that background even more. Um, but yeah, you can just create, you know, with that lens full length, close up, 
I mean, it's really good for close-ups. It just really sings. And what's amazing also is you, do, you don't get any kind of chromatic aberration with this lens. Um, you don't get the purple fringing that's really unflattering when shooting backlit. So you can see that here, you don't get any purple fringing. Uh, so that's really amazing because I used to have to take that out in post-production. So this was just a really fun production that we did. And I ended up doing the product shots at the end. And I would love to show you guys the video that we produced for this. Um, it's up on Nikon's um, YouTube page. Ni uh, video does not play nice with Zoom, unfortunately. I would show that to you guys. Um, but let me answer a couple of questions here. Um, let's see. How long do you use a disc before you can no longer trust it? That's a good question. So how long can you use a hard drive before you can no longer trust it? I use these hard, I mean, I have hard drives that are from 12 years ago and they, they work great. And I have multiple backups of those. So, I mean, I think that the, they, you know what, I don't know if the G tech has ever given me a, um, an amount of years they stay good for, but I, I it's quite a long time. I don't, don't quote me on this, but I think it's something like 20 years or 30 years. So um, it's a very good question. I'll have to inquire about the exact timing on that, but all of my hard drives I've ever used since I started that are SanDisk or G drive, they all, they're all sitting right here and they all work amazing. So still, still using them because I still have to go back to my archives for different projects and whatnot. Um, do you have a preference working with natural light, artificial light, or a combination of both? Um, Mike from Zimbabwe. How cool that you're you're way over there. That's amazing. <laughs> Hi, Mike. Um, so, I mean, if my preference, if I'm just shooting by myself with a model, I definitely prefer natural light because then I can really focus on my connection with my subjects um, as opposed to kind of having to deal with the lighting and whatnot, uh, strobes. If I've got... Uh, at least an assistant, it's nice to add a strobe in there. Um, but my go-to is probably natural light or sometimes continuous light is really nice. If you've got like an ice light or uh, aperture type of light, I love that as well. Cause just what you see is what you get. Uh, strobe takes a little bit more um, skill and learning um, how to work with strobe. But I would definitely say start out with natural light, master that first, master the sun, move on to constant light, master that because it's very similar to natural light and then move on to strobe. Um, and then you'll really know all the things you need to know um, and keep learning and learning and learning because it's just a constant, constant learning in this industry. Um, oh, lens choice for photographing inside buildings. Um Lynch choice. I mean, for architecture photography, I mean, that Nikon, the new Nikkar 14 to 24 is definitely my go-to. Um, I was using like the, the tilt shift lenses and I switched over to the 14 to 24 in the past year. And I've been blown away with that lens. Um, you can get the architecture. It's just the perfect combination, that perfect focal length uh, for photographing inside buildings. So I definitely recommend the 14 to 24. Um, that's definitely a good one. Um, let's see what else we got. Nikon doesn't write to the card while it's tethering. Will that ever change? That's a good question. I'd always, I kind of wish that it would as well. Um, it would be nice if it wrote to the card while you're tethering. I'll have to ask them if they will ever change that. Um, very good question. Let's see. Okay. Let's move on a little bit. This is a recent shoot that I did um, in combination with Medfrodo. Really, really fun shoot. Um, so we had a beautiful ballerina. She's also a model um, that we shot for another campaign. And I just told her to bring all her ballerina gear um, and, you know, just kind of creating and, and, creating some new portfolio work. So we got a mirror involved in this. So we went to and grabbed a big mirror to kind of create these really cool reflections. Um, you can kind of create that, you know, you can do so much cool stuff with mirrors. So this is like getting creative and just going with it and getting your creative juices flowing. 
Um, I bought this tutu, I think it was just on Amazon. You know, I kind of tend to style some of my own shoots when we don't have a stylist. We did have a great makeup artist on this production. Uh, so, you know, I take what I can get and then I'll do the rest as needed. And it works out really well. You know, I, I like utilizing a tripod when I'll do some kind of intentional blurs um, with this kind of look. You know, it's kind of nice for dancing and whatnot. And uh, we did a lot of stuff with flower at the end. This was really fun. Um, we destroyed the whole studio, but um, we did do some cool stuff. So you take flower and you put it in the model's hands and she can do all these different poses with, with the flower. And it basically just flows around her and looks so beautiful. Um, this was my favorite shot because it kind of reminds me of an angel. Um, and so she was able to kind of create this. We probably created 50 images in camera and there was maybe two that really looked cool um, with the flowers. So um, it's definitely about trial and error. And i had always wanted to do a flower series with dancers or ballerinas. And this kind of finally gave me the opportunity to do that. Um, just such a fun, fun shoot. Um, we did use strobe here to freeze the motion. Um, and creating really directional type of light. You kind of have to backlight some of the, the flower and also front light from the side to kind of bring out that texture. Um, but it's very simple stuff, just like one or two. I think we use two lights here. Very simple, very easy. Um, helps having a great model to work with. And then this is kind of an example of a shot list. So from different fashion shoots, uh, we do, you know, we'll get a shot list from the client this was from GTEC or Sandus Professional, and they'll show exactly what they're looking for. So sometimes they'll sketch what they need. Sometimes they'll show me go-bys of what they're looking for, but this is really helpful when I go in and create. So we know exactly the shots that they're looking for. And then we kind of figure, it out, figure out a production around it to create exactly what they're looking for. So this is one of the shots that we created for this campaign for the new Sandus drives. Um, and then obviously you get in talent and models as needed. Um, she's a content creator. So we had her in there, you know, kind of lifestyle modeling with the drive, very simple stuff. Um, but that's really kind of how it works when you're working with clients. They'll usually give you a pretty good shot list. This was actually a new jewelry shoot for Pat uh, Patron Magazine. Um, very simple one light setup. They didn't really necessarily give me a shot list, but they had certain jewelry pieces that they wanted in every shot. Um, these are Harry Winston, I believe, and I've never had to have a security guard for the jewelry on set before, but this was one of those uh, moments. So we had security in there because I guess the jewelry is worth quite a lot of money. Um, so it was cool to work with the jewelry. Uh, this is literally one light, very, very easy um, cut type of setup. Um, we had a flag on one side to create that nice shadow and then just uh, a light with an umbrella on it, a shoot through umbrella to kind of illuminate the model's face. So very simple stuff. All these are lit the similar way. When you're shooting an editorial, it's a good idea to keep your lighting kind of consistent throughout the editorial because um, it's going to all, it needs to flow within the magazine really nicely. So they're all kind of have similar cropping um, similar looks, just different wardrobe or different accessories. Um, I've photographed this model a lot, Kate. She's incredible. She won um, the Kim Dawson model search a few years ago. So love, love, love working with her. Um, yeah, and then we had a great makeup artist, LB Rose Rosser on this as well. So it's always good to get to work with some cool crew, but you can see the setup here with just the strobe the shoot through umbrella facing away and it just bounces nicely softly back into your subject. Um, very rarely do we have the light shining directly on the subject. We're usually bouncing it off of something just because it's a little bit softer and a little bit more natural. Um, you can see the flag as well to create a nice little bit of a shadow. So those are what they kind of look like in camera. And we, you know, we set up this inside the editor's house very easy. We weren't gifted, you know, huge tall ceilings or anything like that to work with, but we still, you know, make it happen and it looked really beautiful. Yeah, let's see. Some good questions. Um, will you be updating your fashion and lifestyle book? Yes, I need to, that's definitely on my to-do list. I have so much new work I need to post on my website and I just, I have not, I've been in productions for the past 
gosh, five months. I've had no time to update anything on my website or my Instagram. It's just been nuts. Um, but I plan to soon. Great question. <laughs> um, Susanna asks, when do you do these, when, oh, when you do these personal projects, how do you get them out there to get exposure and presumably new work? Um, yeah, so when I do these personal projects, I will obviously, ideally, update my website with those, Instagram, um, and also do a gallery show. Um, you know, a few years ago when I did my book launch, I did a gallery show with all of my new work, and that's a really amazing tool. You can ask your dream clients, you know, send them an invite to come. Um, that's one of the best ways to really get your name out there, because even if they don't come They'll see that you're doing this big gallery opening. They'll see the new work from it. You can send them a recap video or something like that afterwards. Um, that's a really great way to get your name out there. It is a lot of work to do gallery show, but it's definitely worth it. Otherwise, I would definitely share it out on social, you know, um, send out your new work via email to the different uh, brands and ad agencies you're interested in shooting for. Um, get as get it out to as many people as possible. That's a very, very good question. And then how do models start getting jobs? Yeah, that's also a good question. So models, um, the best way for models to start getting jobs is, so every agency, if you look up, you know, fashion age, fashion model agency, wherever you live, like in Dallas, there's about four of them that are really good. Uh, Kim Dawson, Campbell Agency, Wallflower, Klutz Agency. Um, so basically they will have open calls every week and usually on their website at the bottom, it'll say, hey, if you're interested in becoming a model, show up to our open call on Tuesdays between five and six. So I would definitely go to the open calls at those different agencies. Um, and usually you'll want to show up just, you know, nice hair, makeup, not too over overdone or anything like that. And just like jeans and a cool t-shirt um, show up. If you have done a couple of test shoots, you could show them that. And then they will direct you on how to start getting jobs because they'll start booking you work and kind of help you develop your career. That's really the best and I guess easiest way, unless you want to be like an influencer Instagram type of model, which um, those jobs probably might not pay as much as the agency jobs. I guess it depends if you're a huge influencer, they probably pay quite well, but um, that's, I'd say that's probably the best way is going to the open calls with the modeling agencies. Um, and then someone, uh, Vincenzo asked, do you use a beauty dish in your beauty shoot or do you prefer umbrella or soft boxes? Yeah. So we, <laughs> I feel like my crew and I, we go through phases. I mean, I love the beauty dish for a while there. I was using the beautiful Mola beauty dish on a lot of my shoots. And then I started using the pro photo one, which is the white interior. It's a little bit softer than the silver. Um, so I was using that for a while, but lately it's kind of like I go through phases of wanting to use different modifiers right now we're all into the shoot through umbrella <laughs> which is like the most simple kind of gear you can imagine um and then I also love the strip boxes as well I don't use a ton of uh like octa boxes recently I do love the parabolic but man the shoot through umbrella lately has been my go-to very very simple easy stuff like this one this was a job for Michael Kors um and we literally, they wanted like paparazzi type of look. So I literally used just the B1 just above my camera. I had my assistant hold it above my camera just to create that kind of a little bit cleaner on camera flash type of paparazzi look. So it really kind of depends on what the client is, is looking for, but it really gives it a real punchy type of look. It's kind of cool for fashion photography. Um, it's a little cleaner than like your, your ring flash or your on-camera flash. I just always hate using on-camera on flash. So we'll obviously take it just slightly off camera, but just with that one, that one light, the B1, very, very simple stuff. Um, this is in a really cool bar um, and with the new Michael Kors bag that we were shooting. So, you know, the lighting kind of depends on what your client's looking for. And it also depends on the mood that you're looking to, to convey. This was kind of like a paparazzi type of, of mood uh, for this particular shoot. So that's a really good question. Um, and then lately I've been doing a lot of shoots with animals. <laughs> I know I share this stuff a lot, but I just, I love working with animals. Um, it's been, it become such a, a passion of mine um, and just capturing that connection between the model and the animal and 
And I just, I love animals. So any chance that I can be around animals, I am so in for um, this. And this uh, was an Appaloosa, I believe, and uh, just beautiful horse, a cool ranch that we were shooting at, a friend of mine. Um, and those are some chaps that I found online. You know, I kind of actually styled the shoot. It's very minimal, but minimal fashion kind of be cool. Um, and obviously I'm from Texas, so you'll get kind of a lot of Texas vibes in here. And then, you know, we did a lot of different shots with the, with Gerald, the giraffe. I plan on photographing him again soon for sure. But I love what the stylist brought because I love it when the wardrobe matches the animal print, um, which is a really fun, fun look. And uh, Gerald actually got married to Harriet, uh, which is another beautiful orphan giraffe. And they had baby Joy. So it's so much fun. I can't wait to photograph the little, their little baby giraffe. Uh, such a fun shoot. So this is kind of like my backpack on location. So when I'm out kind of in remote areas, um, you can kind of see how I pack my camera bag with all the prime lenses. And uh, I also, so I created these, I always had trouble finding my lenses in the bags with the normal lens cap. So I created these lens labels. They're industrial labels that are like, they're impossible to get off once you put them on. Um, they're kind of like this rubbery material. So I actually created these and we're gonna be launching these soon um, on lenslabels.com. So if you need lens labels for your camera bag, definitely check that out here in about a month. I think the, the website will be live. Um, but they've been a really helpful tool and in, in all the stuff that I've been doing, be able to, being able to find lenses a lot quicker, um, than I used to. So it's been very, very helpful. I feel like I'm running out of time here. Yeah. 602. Um, and we'll kind of end on this stuff, but um, let me know if you guys have any other questions. This was a recent shoot with Landry. She's one of my absolute favorite models and you get that beautiful wind in her hair. Um, you can kind of see how we use the battery operated leaf blower. Uh, her mom is actually using it here to kind of create some of that nice wind in her hair. Really interesting, uh, clean type of looks. So we utilize this a lot. This is in the Fort Worth Stockyards. So much fun. Question, do you ever use flash with horses? Do they get spooked? Yes, they do get spooked. Um, it depends. So it totally depends on the animal. We did not use flash with this particular horse. Most animals are gonna get spooked with the, um, with the strobe. So I don't recommend using strobe with animals usually. Sorry, um, but some animals are trained and they are cool with it. So, um, you know, it's a really good idea to ask the owner if they're comfortable with it. <coughs> and if they are, then you can use strobe. If not, I would definitely use natural light. Um, that's kind of my go-to is just to ask the owner of the animals. Like this is Flash. He was totally good with strobe and flash photography. Um, very, very easy. Um, easy to work with, really cool animal. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. Um, but yeah, that's been such a fun adventure. And um, I love working with the animals. It's definitely my my ultimate passion. So um, yeah, someone asked if I could repeat the giveaway stuff. Yes, so if you follow me on Instagram, here in about an hour, I'm going to pick a, <clears throat> a winner um, to send a gift to. So I'll do that. And then um, obviously... <clears throat> If you can um, go onto the Adorama page, <clears throat> sorry guys, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> you can sign up for the giveaway for the, the G-Tech SSD, so. Awesome, thank you guys for tuning in. I really appreciate you. <laughs>